Um, today, we, we had the honor to have Dr. Song Li um, to uh, you know, give us a wonderful presentation. So a little, a little bit of background about Song. So um, <clears throat> um, Dr. Li is the Chancellor Professor and the Chair of the Department of Bio, uh, Biomed Engineering at UCLA. He got his uh, BS and Master's degree in Peking University, you know, one of the top universities in China, and had his PhD and a postdoctoral training in bioengineering in UC San Diego. He was a professor of bioengineering at UC Berkeley between 2001 and 2015. I was actually a postdoc at Berkeley in 2009, so a little overlap in the middle. In 2016, Dr. Lee joined the bioengineering faculty at UCLA. Um, you know, again, as I said, he's the chancellor professor and chair of the biomedical engineering department, but also with a joint appointment in the Department of Medicine. This research focuses on mechanical transduction, cell engineering, and regenerative medicine. We share kind of similar interests in stem cells and epigenetics when we chat last time. Uh, his lab takes a very inter interdisciplinary approach to investigate mechanical transduction about physical physical regulation from single cell to system level and to develop therapeutics by engineering stem cells, immune cells, and uh, micro nano materials. So uh, Lee has been, uh, doc, um, Dr. Lee has been elected as a fellow of American Institute of Medical and Bio Biological Engineering, a fellow of Biomedical Engineering Society, and a fellow of the International Academy of Medical and Bio Biological Engineering. And today, uh, Song's talk will be engineering stem cells and about materials for neuromuscular regeneration. My understanding is has some very exciting new data. So with that, um, um, Song, it's all yours. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Xilin, for your kind introduction. Um, today, I want to talk about some of our work uh, in the area of uh, neuromuscular regeneration. The research in our lab is focused on cell and tissue engineering. Um, on the one hand, we are trying to understand how the microenvironmental factors, especially uh, biophysical factors, could work together with all of these uh, biochemical and biological cues to regulate cell functions, including a variety of uh, cell types, specifically stem cells and immune cells, are something we are very interested uh, in our current research. On the other hand, we're interested in translating what we learn from in vitro studies and apply um, the, uh, all of these materials, stem cell um, technologies to uh, specific uh, applications in tissue regeneration. We have uh, work on various tissues, uh, such as blood vessels, um, spinal cord, and neuromuscular tissues. So uh, today I want to focus on neuromuscular regeneration and this is also an area we have some ongoing collaboration with uh, Tarasaki uh, Institute uh, through uh, a former uh, lab member from uh, Ali Kadam Hosseini's group, Tyler Hoffman. And here I show some uh, representative publications, a couple of them involve the collaboration with uh, Tarasaki. And specifically, this uh, recent paper is in press, uh, well, here in Matter, uh, what we uh, did was to use this biodegradable microneedles to deliver uh, small molecules and uh, cytokines to modulate the local um, inflammatory uh, cells in trying to tune the uh, macrophages and T cells from uh, pro-inflammatory to uh, pro-healing uh, stage. And in this case, we can promote the uh, periodontal tissue regeneration. So today, what I plan to do is to uh, uh, kind of summarize what we have done in this area. Um, and I want to uh, talk about some of the previous work in, and then focus on three uh, recent uh, stories. And one is the stem cells for uh, uh, muscle regeneration. And two is use of biophysical factors, in this case, electrical stimulation to promote neuromuscular uh, junction formation. And, and finally, a recent work on the stem cell for in situ, in vivo uh, muscle uh, regeneration. So we know uh, muscle is the uh, most abundant tissue in our body. It plays a very important 
uh, role in, in many different kind of functions, not just motivation, but also uh, breathing in, in many other uh, aspects. And there are many uh, different uh, reasons that could cause uh, uh, muscle dis degeneration or dysfunction. For example, traumatic injury um, in the battlefield due to accident, et cetera. Or it could be related to other diseases, right? So for example, uh, motor neuron disease, peripheral nerve injury, um, and also there are um, diabetes uh, cause uh, uh, complications. So all of these can cause uh, uh, muscle dysfunction. So our focus is mostly related to traumatic injury um, in the in, in peripheral nerve and also muscle directly or indirectly. And we're trying to use biomaterials and stem cells to regenerate uh, peripheral nerve in, in muscle. So when I uh, studied uh, the research in this area at Berkeley, uh, we first addressed the uh, issue of peripheral nerve regeneration. So at the beginning, we, we thought about you know, using uh, biomaterials with certain micro nanostructure to facilitate uh, axon growth through the uh, gap of um, injured peripheral nerve. For example, sciatic nerve, you have injury. In general, people will uh, connect them, reconnect this with a, a nerve conduit, uh, with the goal to uh, prevent the fibrosis in between um, to block this path, in addition to guide uh, axon growth towards the, uh, the nerve and muscle. In the nerve, we know there's a, all of this alignment of uh, axons and also this uh, structure uh, with, with uh, surrounding tissue. So one idea is to uh, facilitate axon growth with uh, uh, micro nano uh, fibers and we use uh, electro spinning technique, which is widely used now to make conduit with the line fibers in the uh, longitudinal direction of the nerve conduit. And in addition, we could also um, attach bioactive molecules either extracellular matrix components such as laminin, it could be fibronectin or any other matrix proteins, and a uh, growth factor as the representative, we use the basic fibro fibroblast growth factor here. In, in vitro, we could see that if you take a piece of uh, this uh, uh, dorsal root ganglion tissue uh, from a um, mouse and drop on this scaffold, you observe how axons can grow on this uh, scaffold with different structures. If you have random fibers on these electrospan fibers, uh, you do not see much um, axon growth from this tissue. If you have alignment, this actually uh, help axon growth and in, in guide them in a, a, a bi-directional way. For example, you could go either to the right or to the left. And if you uh, have a matrix protein on the surface, for example, laminin, you can further enhance axon growth in a, in a soluble uh, BFTF or uh, uh, immobilized BFTF could have a, a further enhancement. So this shows the combination of biophysical cues together with all of these kind of cues could uh, promote axon growth more effectively. So with this uh, uh, in mind, uh, we engineer this uh, um, electrospinning device to make nerve conduit uh, with uh, aligned fibers on the inner surface, but the random fibers on the outer surface. So the idea is to keep the mechanical integrity with these random fibers, but uh, um, on the inner surface, you have this alignment of fibers to enhance axon growth. And we did this uh, experiment in the RAM model. Um, when you have this uh, one centimeter gap, transaction of peripheral nerve, you connect it with nanofibrous nerve conduit, and then we examine the axon growth through this after a few weeks. And you, you could see here, um, when we use this uh, uh, approach to guide the uh, uh, axon growth in, at, at the different locations of this uh, um, nerve conduit, you know, one, two, three, we basically have the upstream, the proximal end in the middle, and also the distal end, you can see uh, the conduit finally will be filled up with this uh, axon. This shows the cross section. And outside, you can see this uh, uh, electrospine conduit. And inside here, the green dots are the axons. If you compare the 
regeneration um, efficiency of all of these groups. And we compare a short term, which is two months, and you see very uh, obvious enhancement, even though it's partial with aligned fibers, but with random fiber is much slower. And after uh, one year, you can still see some difference. And all of this can be compared with the clinical gold standard with autograph. And here, the cross section also shows the quality of this regeneration. For example, uh, if you have aligned fibers, it's uh, faster regeneration. You also see more myelinated um, axon, uh, uh, axon uh, with in, in this uh, cross section. And well, if you have random fiber, the regeneration of axon is there, but the quality is not as good uh, as well. Okay, that's the biophysical cue. Now we are trying to add uh, more um, bioactivities in this uh, milk conduit. So one idea is to use stem cells. So we could uh, um, transplant stem cells into, into this conduit, and then hopefully this stem cell can differentiate uh, into certain cell types or secret certain factors to enhance axon growth across this gap. So currently there's a critical gap um, in, in, uh, in human, it's a three centimeter long. After that, uh, if it's longer than that, it's difficult to regenerate. In, in a rat model, it's one centimeter. So um, when we use stem cells, we may also have a question is, uh, for example, what stem cell should we use? Uh, a variety of stem cells, you know, people uh, used to, uh, for example, mesenchymal stem cells, and, and there are many other options too. For example, we isolated stem cells from blood vessel wall or People could use uh, adipose tissue derived stem cell, etc. And we actually select a different cell type. I will talk about that in the next few slides. And the second question is you know, should we use undifferentiated stem cells or fully differentiated functional cells you know, uh, in, in, for, for the transplantation? Right? So, in, in, of course, uh, for some cell types, if these stem cells are multipotent, there's a concern about the no specific uh, differentiation. You know, whether the cells were differentiated to the right cell types in this regenerated microenvironment is uncertain. So we, we need to uh, understand whether uh, the differentiation stage of stem cells could be uh, uh, important. And the third thing is the functional role of these transplanted stem cells. Right? The stem cells uh, in the microenvironment, as I mentioned, in now people mostly um, kind of uh, talk about uh, two potential mechanisms. One is direct differentiation, the other one is indirect pathway through this paracrine signaling. So um, after uh, we uh, compare different cell types, we decided to uh, use uh, uh, one cell types that have not been, uh, have not been uh, used before, which is neuroprestem cells. And these cells actually uh, what defined during the development in the neural crest. You see this green color. And it's interesting, these cells are, are really multipotent and more capable uh, for differentiation than the sentinel stem cells. And sometimes people call this the fourth germ layer in addition to the traditional three germ layers we, we talk about. In, um, in this table, you can see some of the cell types uh, these cells uh, uh, can differentiate into. You know, um, I just uh, highlight a few things. For example, neuron cells or the uh, um, Schwann cells, right? And also, you, you could differentiate into uh, mesenchymal cells as well. So that's a more kind of, uh, uh, in, in a way, potent than um, mesenchymal stem cells. Because for mesenchymal stem cells, it is difficult for them to become neural cell types. It's also interesting that uh, the whole peripheral nervous system including uh, both uh, peripheral neurons and Schwann cells are derived from neuroprice stem cells uh, in the development. So that justify a, a use of these cells for uh, 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 peripheral neuro, neuro uh, regeneration. So where can we get these cells? So in the adult tissues, we, we found uh, some uh, interesting source, some kind of uh, uh, residue of this uh, undifferentiated neural crest stem cell in, in the local tissue. Indeed, you can find some of those, for example, in the blood vessel wall, in, in other tissue, or even um, 
in uh, mixed up with this strong cell population. But the most abundant source is from uh, platypotent stem cells, right? So through the development in a, a well-established protocol from uh, outgrouping many other groups to show that you could use either embryonic stem cells or induce platypotent stem cells to derive these cells. Um, and what we did was to first derive neuroprest stem cells, and then uh, we do further differentiation into uh, Schwann cells, and we compare the regenerative capability of these uh, two differentiation stages. And when we transplant the cells, we also um, include some hydrogel that could enhance cell survival and provide this microenvironment that, uh, that's more cell-friendly. We use hyaluronic acid, um, and also you could use uh, other matrix, for example, uh, collagen gel, et cetera. And then this was uh, included in the nerve conduit you know, uh, before the surgery, and then we uh, compare the regenerative potential. So here just uh, quickly shows the characterization of these neuroprest stem cells. Uh, these cells, you make a neurosphere, you know, embryo body-like structure, and you let them attach, and finally you can get these cells. You could do cell sorting based on some of these uh, uh, neuroprest stem cell marker, or you could also do clonal expansion to get a relatively pure population. And here just shows uh, uh, the, with time during this differentiation, and gradually you are going to lose the platypotent markers, and then you have an increase of neuroprest markers, for example, SOS10, nesting, etc. So when you uh, transplant stem cells, indeed, if you compare that with the acellular new condo, that's the, the, the version 1.0, right? So now it's version 2.0. And we did observe that uh, with neuroprest stem cells or neuroprest stem cell derived Schwann cells, um, there's some enhancement, but uh, the neuroprest stem cell seems to be better if you compare this. Seems that the undifferentiated cell, neuroprest stem cells, uh, could uh, outperform the differentiated cells. If you uh, examine the um, cross section of these cells, you could see that. Um, you know, here we, we show this, uh, the tolubin blue staining showing this uh, uh, cross section of axon or with uh, uh, more clearly identify the, the cell types with uh, S100 beta to so stain for Schwann cells and neurofilament, uh, you can stain for axons. You can see that uh, some of these uh, uh, structure in detail that uh, uh, you have this myelinated axon in the uh, in, in the nerve conduit. And we also found that actually uh, this, uh, these are the human uh, IPSL derived uh, uh, neuroprest stem cells and they can be identified by human antigen. Uh, these are pneuma and we can see this is a longitudinal section. We see some of these uh, nucleus, human nucleus already incorporated into these uh, uh, surrounding cells. Uh, around axons. So that shows differentiation is involved. The other thing we, 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 we notice is this uh, um, paracrine factors, right? So when you compare uh, a few paracrine factors uh, that involve in nerve regeneration, um, here you can see uh, NGF, BDNF, and CNTF, these are three major ones we compared. And we found that neuroprest stem cell actually could secrete much more uh, of these uh, uh, two factors, then the neuroprest uh, stem cell derived from cell. So there's some advantage um, to use neuroprest stem cell undifferentiated uh, for tissue regeneration, because they can differentiate into, um, into Schwann cell as well and be integrated in, into the tissue. So that was uh, uh, the, the, the story for preferred nerve uh, uh, regeneration. And then uh, Lian Li is, is a, a MDPhD student, and she did this work to directly inject neuroprest stem cells into muscle. Because when you have a, a nerve injury, you know, uh, when the nerve regenerate, they, they, they grow across the gap. The next important issue, which is also critical, is uh, whether you have a effective re innovation into the muscle. Right? Without an innovation, the muscle will have uh, atrophy, finally. So now the question is, can we enhance this um, interface 
uh, re reformation between nerve and muscle using neuroplast stem cells. So neuroplast stem cells, if you know that they can secrete these neurotrophic factors locally. In human development, it also enhances this uh, neuromuscular uh, junction formation. So we um, use this approach again, um, but it, there's one difference. One issue uh, for the stem cell injection into, into any uh, tissue, for example, muscle or other tissue is that the cell survival rate is very low. So um, we uh, use uh, this neuroplast stem cell and make them into steroid and aggregate. The idea is these cells will survive uh, much better in vivo because they have this cell cell adhesion uh, to avoid the, the stressful condition and doing this homing process when the stem cells are uh, injected. In addition, we also want to compare in the muscle whether neuroplast stem cell could have any advantage over uh, widely studied mesenchymal stem cells. So this is the, the, the uh, description of this uh, approach. We did, uh, we, we first made this spheroid of neuroplast stem cells, and we did some comparison in vitro in this uh, kind of a neuromuscular tissue model. And then we compared uh, how these mesenchymal stem cells or neuroplast stem cells, um, uh, see whether they can have different effects on neuromuscular junction formation in vitro. And then we tested in, in vivo. So in vitro, um, we, we use different approaches. This is what uh, this was done before. And one is the micro grooves, and the other one is uh, electrospan fibers with aligned uh, uh, nanofibers. And we culture um, the myoblasts that can uh, fuse into muscle. In, in addition, the um, motor neurons derived from the prepotent cells. And here it shows the motor neurons in green. And then uh, the, the red color is the, the myo tubes. Uh, so you can see that uh, some of these already form uh, the neuromuscular uh, interaction in the, uh, some dots showing the neuromuscular junction formation in each other. In the spheroid, uh, the size uh, does matter. Uh, if you have a, a spheroid which is too big, for example, over 1,000 cells per spheroid, you may see some cell deaths in a core area is the lack of uh, nutrient and, um, and, and oxygen supply. So this is a kind of a transport issue. So we decided to use uh, spheroid like with less than 500 cells in each of these uh, uh, during this fabrication procedure. And um, we, we compare the, the secretome with uh, ELISA you know, to profile the neurotrophic factors and here you can see that uh, the spheroid, which is in the red color, in general, will either be equivalent or uh, more effective than this uh, 2D uh, grown uh, neuroplast stem cell in secreting all of these uh, neurotrophic factors. So in vitro, in this uh, neuromuscular tissue model, when you uh, did co-culture of uh, uh, neuroplast stem cell spheroid or mesenchymal stem cell spheroid, we observe some, some difference. And here just shows some of these uh, co culture uh, immunofluorescent uh, images. Um, if you examine the neuromuscular junction formation, what we found is in the presence of neuroplast stem cell spheroid, the formation of neuromuscular junction was more effective than any other groups. For example, mesenchymal stem cell did not. Uh, enhance the neuromuscular junction formation um, in, in this in vitro uh, tissue model. So another advantage, as I mentioned, is the uh, survival uh, rate of these spheroids. If you inject this into the hind limb of the uh, rats, right, you can see that if it's a single cell, within a few days, all of these cells disappear. You know, they, they could be uh, either dead or removed um, or uh, probably cleared completely by the immune system. Well, if you have a spheroid, you can see you know, that there's even potentially some cell growth at the beginning and then gradually um, maintain a, a relatively stable level for over months. So here shows this uh, luminescence image of these uh, cells that are still there after months. 
So when we examine the functional recovery, we look at the electrophysiology and, and gate function. And here, um, this is the, the, the summary of the electrophysiology. For example, the um, compound muscle action potential with uh, this neurocrest stem cell spheroid. It could uh, enhance significant, significantly, while the mesenchymal stem cell did not have significant effect in this model. But that shows if you inject these cells into the muscle, neurocrest stem cells are better, and also the, the spheroid form uh, for the delivery uh, could uh, help the cells survive the, the environment and enhance the regeneration potential. And if you uh, stain the muscle cross-section and also uh, uh, with high resolution image showing this uh, neuromuscular junction formation, you can quantify, and this takes a, a lot of effort to quantify many, many different sections. Um, you can see the, in general, the, 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 the fiber area um, in, with neuroclast stems are transplanted, it's better. And also this uh, innovative uh, muscle, you have much more. Uh, innovative muscle when you have neural cleft stem cell uh, sphere or transplant. So that, that was, was the uh, uh, first story re regarding the combination of my materials, especially uh, stem cells for peripheral nerve and muscle regeneration. So now I want to uh, switch to the second uh, story, which is uh, kind of a biophysical cue, but in, in a kind of more dynamic way using electrical stimulation. So people have reported that uh, electrical signals are very important, right? Not, not only just for the neural signal by itself, but also as an external stimulation to enhance uh, nerve and muscle function. So people also use that for spinal, for spinal regeneration as well. So in, in this case, what we try to do is to have a, kind of a chronic therapy, a physical therapy, instead of uh, doing just electrical stimulation once, you know, people have done that in clinical trial. For example, when you um, connect the nerve, you, you can have a stimulation at upstream trying to signal to spinal cord so that the axon can, can start grow, growing towards the, uh, the downstream, right? But that one, one time signal was not sufficient. So uh, people have shown that after the initiation of an axon growth, the rate of growth was not further enhanced because you only have one stimulation, and it, it, it's easy to under, understand that probably it's not sufficient. So we're trying to do chronic stimulation. So one problem is how to, uh, how to realize this, right? So you need to do some, um, uh, make some device to achieve that. So this project was uh, done by uh, Ban Shu, who is actually a, a, a surgeon in, in collaboration with uh, John Rogers group at Northwestern. Um, in this case, uh, we use one device they developed, which is um, uh, kind of a highly flexible and, and biodegradable device. And we, we study with uh, a different uh, kind of a, this uh, coil as a receiver implantable under the skin. And the first version didn't work out because the neck was too short. And for the uh, wireless electrical transduction, we need the receiver to be uh, subcutaneous, but also close to the skin. So we have this uh, long uh, neck. And however, this could be broken. You can see that uh, after a few days, right, this could be broken uh, because the rat was moving and uh, the muscle, uh, and that's a highly uh, 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 movable area. And so we need to have something more uh, stable. In, and then we use this uh, uh, serpentine uh, kind of shape of uh, uh, neck in, in wire, and this could last long enough. We also optimize the electrical signal, for example, the voltage. You know, we we, we uh, found out that in this range, you can have a, a good stimulation. We also test a different frequency. So there are a lot of these uh, uh, characterization to see which one could have a sufficient um, effect on the uh, nerve regeneration. So basically, we, we place this hosing uh, uh, package in this uh, transparent, fully uh, urethane uh, membrane. You know, it's put under the skin in all components, including metal and polymers, all biodegradable. And for electrical stimulation, every day, 
we could just apply this diminution for 30 minutes or one hour. Um, and then um, we don't need to perform a second surgery. You just put a, um, this uh, 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 device, wireless device, with this uh, radio frequency, we can reach out and then apply the electrical signal around the nerve conduit. So here shows a, a more detail of this device. And basically, it's a, a sandwich case. Uh, in, inside, we have this uh, uh, silicon uh, diode. And then outside is this biodegradable polyurethane package. And there's, a, there's a extensive mechanical testing um, and also electrical uh, testing as well. And the whole system is bi uh, biodegradable, also biocompatible. And we did a detailed study here to show some example um, how the cells could be cultured on these materials in in vivo uh, implantation under the skin. We show there's no significant uh, fibrosis or inflammatory responses around this material. So here shows the functional difference. And we did this test to compare a single stimulation. That means when you use the nerve conduit to connect um, the, the two ends of the nerve, you give a single stimulation. In this case, it's the uh, distal end. You know, we want to see whether we can um, apply this electrical signal so that the, the nerve muscle interface could sense the signal and prevent um, muscle atrophy. Right? So with innovation in electrical signal, the muscle atrophy could be um, slowed down. That, that's our hypothesis. And we compare this single stimulation with multiple stimulation. Because when you have this transaction of the nerve, basically the muscle nerve communication is gone. But during this phase, before the axon growth can reach to the muscle uh, uh, inside the tissue, um, if you give electrical stimulation, we can maintain this signal uh, at least uh, uh, for a certain way in, in a certain time period so that the atrophy can be slowed down. And we found that. Um, for the muscle weight recovery, you know, if you have the nerve grow across after a few weeks, um, in addition, uh, for, for muscle atrophy comparison, we can see that with multiple stimulation, in this case, we, we did that for uh, uh, about eight days. Every other day, we uh, provide this electrical stimulation. We can see the muscle mass can be preserved. And if you look at the function, and was, uh, uh, this is gate function, the multiple stimulation is also better. Electrophysiology uh, also shows significant enhancement. And actually, single stimulation doesn't really enhance the compound muscle action potential significantly. We could also uh, examine the um, histology. In, you know, it's a similar. We look at the muscle fiber area and the uh, uh, number of uh, neuromuscular junctions. Uh, per unit uh, area, and we could see that all of this could be enhanced by, uh, by the multiple uh, electrical stimulation. Okay, so that's the, uh, the second story uh, in, in this electrical stimulation. So the, the, the third example I want to uh, discuss is this uh, uh, stem cell based therapy in, in the muscle. Of course, uh, we, we know that at, at a muscle, uh, neuromuscular junction, you know, we need to do something. For example, as we shown, uh, the, the neuroclast stem cell transplantation. In addition, for muscle itself, it's uh, well known that the muscle regeneration or muscle mass uh, recovery are related to the local stem cells. For example, these uh, satellite cells are quiescent on the surface of myofibers. When you have injury, um, inflammatory cell signals, these cells can be activated and they will start to differentiate into um, muscle cells, infuse and repair these uh, uh, myofibers. So for this process, you know, we have this um, intrinsic regeneration potential in the muscle. However, if you have significant muscle loss, uh, that, that may be difficult. In addition, in some case, for example, aging or other diseases, you may not have a, a, a good quality of stem cells 
or you um, may not have a good environment for uh, muscle regeneration. So one limiting factor for volumetric muscle loss, for example, is you don't have enough uh, muscle stem cells. Um, you could use iPS cells or embryonic stem cells to derive muscle cells. That's an unlimited source. But there's evidence these uh, cells do not uh, mature to form this uh, muscle. So one idea is to see whether we can get uh, some uh, muscle stem cell from adult tissue. And if these cells can be expanded effectively uh, in vitro or can be stimulated to uh, expand in vivo, that may enhance uh, muscle regeneration. So uh, we know that um, besides all of these uh, growth factors, chemical compounds have been uh, used for um, a variety of applications, for example, to modulate uh, the reprogramming process, right? And also use that for different disease therapy. And all of these chemical compounds usually target certain pathways. For example, it could be differentiation, cell growth, uh, migration, etc. cetera. And, and with a certain clear targets of, uh, of, of signaling molecules. And of course, uh, it's complicated, right, to find out the right cocktail for uh, certain uh, modulation, right? So in, in general, it's through a larger scale uh, drug screening, you can start with the library of chemical compounds with you know, 200,000 chemicals, and you can screen for, uh, for those that may have some effects. And we, we did some work uh, 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 when I was still at, at Berkeley, actually, and she was a PhD student. So she was trying to reprogram fibroblasts into iPS cells and using a cocktail reported uh, in the literature, which is uh, these five compounds. Um, and this was all, all published. So however, uh, the efficiency was very low in this process compared to transcriptional factor approach. Uh, efficiency was very low and it's very, very slow process and, and it's not consistent. So, but there's one in interesting observation is that um, during the experiment, every time she observed uh, from the fibroblast culture, uh, emerge um, a lot of this uh, beating kind of a myo myotube structure. So at the beginning, we were not sure whether it's kind of myocyte or, uh, or myotube, but with further uh, immunostaining characterization, we found that they are actually skeletal muscle. So now the question is, okay, uh, are these uh, uh, either a reprogramming process or is that a, a differentiation process? You know, differentiation means that uh, it is possible there's a small fraction of uh, muscle stem cells in this fibroblast population, which could be expanded uh, for, uh, for, for potential applications. So first question uh, Jinan tried to address is that the what were the components required uh, for this appearance of uh, this uh, myotube uh, formation in the culture? So what she did was uh, just to remove one of these compounds each time. And what she found is that F and R, F is force clean with a CAMP enhancer, and R actually is a liposopsis inhibitor of TGA beta pathway. These two are required. If these two are removed, you don't have any effect. And she he also tried uh, different combinations, you know, two factors, three or four, and, and she found out actually just uh, two of them uh, together uh, with uh, uh, F and R was sufficient to induce um, this mitral formation. It's actually more effective because some of these other chemical compounds could be even inhibitory for this uh, mitral formation. And they were not ne uh, uh, necessary for this muscle formation, even though they were, they were reported to be involved in IPS cell reprogramming. She also, he also did all of this uh, dose titration um, and also adding different kind of uh, uh, growth factors. Uh, this, this could uh, uh, be present in the local tissue as well. And, and he found that actually ascorbic IC and EFTF have further enhancement for this muscle formation in addition to these chemical compounds. And this induction of uh, 
myogenic cells with these uh, two chemical compounds actually were quite effective. Now, for a couple of days, if you look at the, all of these uh, muscle markers, including PAC7 and other transcription factors, you can see this induction could be 100 or even 1,000 folds within a couple of days. And, and this is uh, quite uh, fast you know, compared to the programming process. Now, if it's reprogramming, in general, we'll at least take a week or two to see some of these uh, uh, reprogrammed cells to convert fibroblasts into to certain cell types. So this is a skin fibroblast. If you can have uh, induction effectively within a, a couple of days, most likely it's due to a selective expansion of the stem cells in this culture. So with this verification, we also uh, uh, determine whether there's any effect on, for example, platypotent genes. We didn't observe that uh, uh, in, in this uh, two chemical cocktail. And we also uh, examine other uh, uh, lineage genes, for example, Hebricane for cartilage, runs 2 for bone, and HAN2 for uh, cardiovascular uh, or, or other lineages. And you can see that you know, all of these have modest changes, you know, one or two folds compared to this. Thousand fold induction is uh, Nick Ledger. Okay, so here you can see this is quite effective to induce uh, beating muscle in culture. And here is the skin fibroblast population. Even with the mixture, without purification, you can see uh, after 10 days, these are mouse cells. You can see the, the beating muscle cell in culture. And if you stand for uh, this uh, uh, myogenic transcription of factor markers. And you can see that up day four and day eight, you have a significant increase of this myogenic cell. That means there's expansion process. In addition, there may be also differentiation because this involves maybe uh, two processes. One is the early expansion of this myogenic cell in addition, and they could differentiate and then form uh, myotube-like structure. Okay, so now the question is, what are, the, uh, uh, what are these fraction of cells, right? Um, in, in this uh, fibroblast uh, mixture? And we did some uh, characterization. In, 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 it's interesting, without a certain marker, uh, you could uh, do uh, a, a differentiation of these cells by using uh, adhesion. So you allow the cells to attach the cordial dish. In after 30 minutes, and some cells are still in suspension, they attach it slower. And then if you take the cells and put in another dish, we found these cells actually are more effective to form uh, uh, myotubes and can be expanded more uh, uh, fast, much faster. So here shows that if you select this population, it's a very crude uh, fractionation. You can see more PAC7 positive cells. And finally, they also form myotube. And this was done by a, uh, uh, postdoc, you know, uh, at the UCLA. And now we want to determine whether this are uh, indeed uh, a kind of a traditional type of um, muscle stem cell or maybe some uh, new type of uh, muscle stem cell from this uh, skin fibroblast. And we use PAC7, which is a classical uh, muscle stem cell marker, linear tracing uh, in, in mouse model. And this is an induced collinear tracing to see whether these muscle stem cells are derived from PAC7 positive cells. So if there's the cells are derived from these PAC7 positive cells, they will be green color, right? So in, in um, this is a green color EOIRPG uh, or yellow um, reporter. So you can see that um, with the chemical treatment, indeed. The cells positive for PAC7, you know, this is a by staining, are also positive for EYFP. So this cell seems to be derived from PAC7 positive cells. If you examine after long term, it's day four, and the day 12, you can see most of this myotube formation, right? So these myotubes are all staying in green. That means they are derived from this PAC7 positive stem cell. So PAC7 seems to be a, at least a major, um, a major, uh, marker for these uh, muscle stem cells in the, in the fibroblasts. So when we do all of this analysis, of course, you can use immunostaining to see the subpopulation of cells 
Um, however, all of these uh, other traditional biochemical analysis, for example, Western blotting or PCR, cannot distinguish this cell. You can only see an average of uh, the uh, gene expression changes, etc. So we did a single cell sequencing uh, with uh, this uh, um, fibroblast. And, and here I just want to point out that uh, you, know, you can see different populations in this fibroblast. So it's not a homogeneous for sure when you take a uh, fibroblast from the skin. And there's a small percentage of these myogenic cells. You can identify that by a profile of a, a myogenic cell gene. And with the chemical treatment, you can see it seems there's a selective expansion of this population. But for the majority of the other cells, fibroblasts, there's no significant change. So the, this chemical compound cocktail can selectively expand this uh, muscle, uh, muscle stem cell. Okay, so what are the status of this muscle stem cell? In, we, we found a very interesting uh, distribution. So if you look at this uh, uh, structure with the profile of these uh, uh, muscle genes, we can identify three subpopulations. Differentiating muscle, that means they're in the process of differentiation. In quiescent muscle, you, know, you can see three uh, polarized distribution. And also proliferating one, that means these muscle cells are expanding, right? Differentiation, expanding, I mean, this means uh, uh, maybe potentially asymmetric uh, or symmetric uh, division of the muscle stem cell. In quiescent doing nothing. And then we compare different samples. And actually, the, the quiescent cells in general, um, the lack of KX67 or any other cell cycle markers, they, they are found in the normal muscle in the tissue without injury. But in these cells, uh, cell culture, we only identify two major populations, uh, which is uh, you can see here um, adult cell, less abundant, right? But for the uh, neonatal cells, you can see that mostly they are in, the, um, in, in, in this proliferating mode. That means they are expanding or somewhat differentiating. Right? This is a chemical treatment. So these two, two ends are basically amplified by the chemical cocktail. So with this finding, uh, we decided to uh, pursue uh, uh, two approaches for muscle regeneration. One is in vitro, so that's a traditional way. You now you could uh, isolate cells from the skin tissue. Uh, you could be autologous uh, in, in this case, and then you expand them in vitro. When you get enough number of uh, muscle stem cells and transplant it into muscle for tissue regeneration. So you basically enhance this expansion process. You can also take the cells from another site instead of from muscle, right? So, Practically, it is not uh, feasible to take a muscle, a piece of muscle, and expand those cells. Right? Skin tissue is easily um, accessible. The second approach is for in situ uh, regeneration. So, in this case, we use drug delivery approach. These chemical compounds uh, are very easy to be delivered, they are stable, and you can use traditional polylactic glycolic acid micro and nanoparticles to uh, encapsulate these compounds and have a sustained release in the muscle after injury. And the idea is to hopefully you can um, enhance the expansion of these muscle stem cells locally and so that the regeneration can be facilitated. And this could be uh, used, for example, for the muscle with a, a not a extensive uh, injury, maybe just a local injury, and that just enhance the uh, regeneration rate. For the first approach, you know, we, uh, we did a, a either sorting uh, or clonal expansion. We, we get a relatively pure uh, population, but there's still some other cells. Uh, it's not 100% pure. Uh, you can see very effective formation of these uh, uh, myogenic cells, and they can also form spheroid. Because when you uh, have one with culture, partially differentiated cells, now you have actually the stem cells uh, differentiated. Uh, at different stages, right? it's not a, a homogeneous. And they can form this spheroid by themselves. You know, we, we don't need to do any fabrication. The cell just self detach and form a spheroid. And you can transplant this spheroid um, in, uh, in, into the tissue. So in vitro, if you want to maintain the cells, uh, for example, on micro pattern surface, you can see this kind of very well aligned uh, myotube formation with this uh, striated pattern as well. 
Okay, so if you inject this uh, muscle stem cell spheroid into the muscle, uh, you can see that um, in this case, we use uh, a rapid fluorescent protein. Uh, we, we, we infected the cells with the virus carrying this uh, protein, uh, the, the DNA that expresses the protein. And in vivo, you can see these transplanted cells, the DS red color, shown, are shown in, in this regenerating muscle. Right? We try this in adult, uh, adult uh, mice aged, or even with uh, muscle dystrophy. In the transplanted cells, of course, they, are, they don't have genetic defect. They can be uh, integrated into the injured muscle. In this case, we use this uh, uh, cardiotoxin chemical injury uh, of the muscle using this model. We also measure the, the uh, force, contraction force of the muscle, and also the muscle weight. There are all significant enhancement when you inject this expanded, uh, expanded uh, muscle stem cells. So for the second approach, we use chemical uh, compound uh, encapsulated into the nanoparticles, PLG and nanoparticles for sustained release. And this curve can be tailored by choosing different uh, PLG, uh, either the, the G and L ratio or the molecular weight. In vitro, indeed, if you have this slow release of chemicals, instead of adding them directly in a soluble form in the culture, you can see the different amount of nanoparticle will have different effects. Um, the, in, the, in this range, you can see a more effective myotube formation. If you just inject a particle into the muscle, we didn't use any uh, hydrogen in this case, we could do that, uh, but uh, it's also helpful to have these particles distributed um, in, in the muscle in, in certain area. And you can see with the uh, two chemical nanoparticle, you have enhanced uh, uh, compound muscle action potential. You can see uh, all the other uh, parameters, the force generation or the uh, uh, muscle weight, all enhanced by injecting the, the chemicals uh, without, the stem, without stem cell. So the idea is these chemicals can enhance the local stem cell, satellite cell expansion and, and differentiation for, for, for muscle regeneration. To verify whether this has some specific effect on the local satellite cells, so we, we also use this uh, linear tracing mice, uh, PAC7, Right, so we, we show that in vivo, um, if you just in, inject the chemicals, you can see an increase of PAC7 positive cells in the local tissue. And that shows uh, uh, partially a mechanism of this regeneration uh, is through the expansion of the local stem cells. There are also some additional benefits because this chemical cocktail includes uh, digital beta inhibitor. We found that there's a suppression of uh, fibrosis in the muscle. And also there's a reduced uh, inflammation uh, with this chemical cocktail injection. And recently we also uh, ex extended this for, for cardiac regeneration. In this case, in collaboration with uh, Dino DiCarlo uh, at UCLA and also Randall Lee's group at UCSF, we, we inject this chemical uh, compounds uh, in the uh, microsphere, you know, we, we figure out a way to encapsulate that into the microsphere and inject it into the heart and demonstrate the uh, improved cardiac regeneration following uh, myocardial infarction. And here shows the encap encapsulation procedure. The key is to avoid this nanoparticle uh, uneven distribution. Because if you, if you use microfluid device to encapsulate particles, in some cases, the microparticle may not have nanoparticle, and some of them have uneven distribution. So uh, we manipulate the, the hydrophilicity of this particle and so that uh, we could uh, achieve a homogeneous uh, distribution in the microparticle. This uh, has been published. Okay, to uh, conclude uh, what we have discussed, uh, we have shown that uh, stem cell, I mean, specifically in this case, neuroprest stem cell uh, spheroids could uh, promote nerve regeneration, also neuromuscular regeneration. 
Well, biophysical cues, uh, uh, electrical stimulation, uh, repetitive electrical stimulation means it's achieved by wireless, in fact, degradable uh, device can also enhance neuromuscular regeneration. In, in a third example, we show that if you identify a potential source of myogenic cells, in this case from skin tissue, you could uh, use chemical cocktail to expand them. And these cells can be uh, used for in, in vitro um, tissue regeneration, for example, transplant cell directly, or in situ regeneration by uh, drug delivery approach. With that, I want to uh, thank um, the former line members who actually perform these studies, and also the, the collaborators uh, who uh, contributed to the uh, work we presented, uh, presented today. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great, Sean. Thanks so much for the great talk. Um, you know, before uh, Mahmoud may you know, uh, take over and kind of you know, uh, read the questions people post on the Q&A. Maybe I can ask you two quick questions. So mm -hmm. first is on the nanofiber alignment uh, for the regeneration, it was fascinating. Uh, for the sciatic nerve, right there, for example, there are like a, you know, A fiber, B fiber, C fiber, right, for different diameters and you know, afferent, efferent. Did you, did you ever kind of look, look into kind of, is there any preference on what type of fibers or is you know, afferent versus efferent? are more kind of, you know, favored uh, during the regeneration? That's a good question. Um, we haven't done that experiment, but uh, we, 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 uh, we, I think it's important to see, you know, whether these different nerve types uh, could have a uh, different regeneration uh, rates, you know, affected by these uh, by physical cues. And then we, we have a new project, uh, funded by NIH uh, on this electrical stimulation, we, we do propose to examine all of these difference, especially you know, uh, motor neurons versus sensory neurons, which could be affected more. Great, and the second question is on, right, fascinating that chronic electrical stimulation can enhance regeneration. And what is the, uh, what is the mechanism in terms of, is it just you know, promoting the axons to kind of extend more? Is you, are you actually promoting the, uh, you know, more, um, you know, proliferation, and um, those cells should be terminally differentiated, right? But are you, are you looking at, you know, are you somehow causing proliferation of the cells and de-differentiation? You're talking about a chemical compound or? Oh, the, no, no, the, the, the electrical stimulation. That the electrical stimulation. The, yeah, the neural muscle yeah, junction regeneration. Actually, uh, it's, it's something we are going to do. We haven't done that for the mechanistic study. It's part of a specific aim that we propose. Um, so we plan to do single cell sequencing for this local tissue and see what happened there because there are many cell types involved, right? So there may be some effect, for example, unknown you know, the electrical signal could affect the immune cells, yeah, could exactly. affect the, the nerve axon growth, can affect the neuromuscular junction and also the muscle itself. Now people are doing this physical therapy directly insert um, the electrodes into muscle, not specifically. And they think that could also help to maintain muscle uh, rehabilitation or whatever uh, for, for, for various reasons. So I, I think this electrical stimulation in vivo could have uh, multiple impacts and, and we, we haven't sorted it out. No, absolutely, right? Yeah, as you said, it even could affect like a macrophage polarization, right? That could uh, also have an effect. No, uh, you're fascinating. Thanks, Song. I'm uh, Matt, Matt, you're all yours. Good questions, yeah. Thanks. Uh, all right, several questions came in. Um, uh, one of them is uh, when you include gels such as collagen into your conduit, do you think the gel itself can also be a barrier for nerve regrowth through the critical gap? I'm asking because collagen is also a key part of the fibrotic scans which are reported to inhibit CNS neuron regeneration. Yeah, yeah. That's a good question. No, um, <clears throat> indeed, for, for muscle regeneration, for nerve regeneration, in, in, in many cases, if you have too much matrix, you could retard regeneration process, right? So this has to be highly degradable uh, in very diluted hydrogel when we use them. For example, hyaluronic acid degrades very slowly. You cannot have too much uh, included in, in this case. Collagen gel actually, in general, is easy to be degraded 
um, in, in fibrin as well. In, you know, during the nerve regeneration early phase, people have shown that this fibrin could even form kind of fibers inside the nerve conduit uh, between the gap to help axon, to guide axon growth. So um, it is important to, to really choose that. We, took, we did some troubleshooting, right? So we also try actually some hydrogels from various groups. Uh, synthetic um, gels in general are not as good as the native matrix for, for this application. In, in some people even design, we, we tried this before with different kind of uh, channels inside the, the conduit, which were not uh, necessarily more effective because part of the cross-section area is blocked by the material. That's a good Thank question. You. Thank you. Did you check the cell subpopulation differentiation distribution with different methods? Um, distribution, you mean in vitro? Yeah, cell subpopulation, oh, subpopulation distribution. I see. Yeah, okay. I see. So you want to uh, compare the, the cocktails, two or yeah. three or four. Um, we, we didn't do that uh, you know, with, for sing, single cell sequencing. Really, uh, it may be interesting to see whether this uh, each chemical could affect this uh, expansion or differentiation process. We only did the work to compare FR, uh, compare that with the control group and also with some adult uh, stem cells as, as a positive control. Thank you. In the skin cell loaded in PLGA, how do you load cells in PLGA? Also, do you use organic solvents? If yes, how do you prevent the organic solvent effect on the stem cells? Um, maybe I didn't make it clear. We didn't load the stem cells into PLGA. For PLGA study, uh, we, we only uh, included this chemical cocktail. And the idea is to inject the chemi uh, chemical cocktail in the particle into the tissue. And then with the sustained release, they were they will um, activate and expand the local stem cells. For in vitro study, it's just a co-culture. We just drop these uh, particles into the culture um, without adding other soluble factors. The PLGA particle is a traditional emulsion process. Can you elaborate, thank you. Can you elaborate on slow adhesion stem cells? What makes them slow, fast adhesion? Can you repeat that question? Can you elaborate on slow adhesion stem cells mm -hmm. and then what makes them slow or fast adhesion? Okay, okay. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. There are some reports in the literature previously because fibroblasts in general, they have, uh, they express more um, adhesion molecules, very strong in adhesion migration. So fibroblasts in general are attached first. In stem cells, they express a specific uh, type of integrin in, in less abundant in general compared to fibroblasts. That's why the, the early attached cells mostly are fibroblasts. So with this procedure, um, you remove a majority of fibroblasts in, in the early adhesion. In the, in the stem cells are, have been reported, uh, some other type of stem cells as well, to attach slower. So that may be a, a, a really kind of a crude fraction uh, nation method. To, to, to separate fibroblasts from the small fraction of stem cell, but it's better to use marker if you have. Surface marker prefer. Thank you. What challenges did you encounter transplantation of differentiated iPSCs? What kind of nanoparticles do you use for drug loading? For drug loading, uh, we, we, nanoparticle we use PRGA in this case, because we just want to achieve a sustained release for one to two weeks. So um, PRJ is commonly used for this uh, short time period. Um, for stem cell transplantation, iPS cell derived cells, in, in general, I think uh, one is you want to make sure these cells are fully differentiated. You want to get rid of any um, residue of uh, platonic cells in, in, in there. Otherwise you may cause teratoma. So indeed that could happen. So you, if you have uh, fully differentiated cells after a few weeks, and if you do a sorting or clonal expansion, to remove potential platelet cells, in general, it's safe to transplant. And another thing, as I mentioned, that the single cells, unless you have matrix as a, a scaffold to inject them, if you just inject the cells alone, the survival rate is very low. So you, you do use a spheroid. We think spheroid can enhance the survival and function of the cells for much longer time period. Thank you. Can we use stem cell therapy for neural cell regeneration 
for diseases like Alzheimer's disease? Alzheimer's, yeah, that, that's um, an essential nervous system. So uh, people have done that. In, in this case, you, you want to use central neurons, probably not, not necessarily neuroclast stem cells. Neuroclast stem cells um, have been used. We have tried that actually for spinal cord regeneration as well. In, in this case, um, the, the neuroclast stem cells can also uh, form astrocyte like uh, cell type to support uh, the spinal cord regeneration. So that, that plays a supporting role. But in, in the brain, you want to use neural stem cell probably. Alzheimer's and others, or degenerative disease, um, so that you can replace part of the uh, degenerative neurons. So I'll be different stem cell source. Another uh, question came in, um, the final question. Um, can we use combination drug therapy and stem cell therapy for Alzheimer's disease? I think it's possible. So, so the Alzheimer's disease, the mechanism is quite different from the peripheral nerve uh, uh, injury or, or neuromuscular injury. So I, I think you are involved uh, different kind of stem cell, different chemical compounds in, in, the, in the kinetics could be different as well. Nice. Yeah, there, there, are, there are reports on, on, on this topic. Nice. Well, thank you for the fascinating talk and for your time, Professor uh, Sangli. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have a nice day. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.